All right. We are recording. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this episode. It's going to be a kind of calm episode. We're just going to have another controversial word episode. Yeah. Just chilling. Talking yes. about one of our favorite words. <laughs> but not. Well, it's been on my mind so many. So like this last six months, I think these two words have been on my mind every day. I've yeah, thought about I bet, it especially quite a lot. With the work that you do. Yes, I have been thinking about it a lot because of work and then also just spending time outside and kind of thinking and being in Jackson, um, it's a intense when you're seeing an aerial view of Jackson, the city is within this bottleneck effect in the valley. And then everything else is open land. And so it's really crazy to see how this somewhat bigger city um next to kind of the south part of the entire greater yellowstone ecosystem mm. so i have thought about two words the two words are wild and wilderness and yeah it's <laughs> it's two words that are brought up a lot when it comes to public lands and that gets me thinking about this very old term that I heard about pretty early in my scientific career is the wild urban interface. Mm. Something I'm sure you're very well acquainted with and something mm -hmm. that you have to deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. And mm -hmm. so we, we're probably not going to get into that very much in this episode, but we, what we will talk about is we're going to define the word as usual and get into the etymology of it as well as the history and then talk about the Wilderness Act of 1964, which is really where things start to change in regard to how the public perceives this as well as how the government treats wilderness areas. And yeah. uh, it's uh, and then and then the rest because, of it's kind of our opinions. Yeah, yeah lots of our exactly opinions is about to happen. So, so many opinions. So get ready for our uh, our opinions on these two words. Um, I think Ledja and I have a interesting look at public lands and also tribal lands and private lands. Um, then, yeah, we're just going to have a conversation about some, in my opinion, controversial words. Yes. And they are controversial because a lot of people, they, they think of wild or wilderness, and they either don't think about it, or they think too much about it, or they have a very hyper political view about it, or a very mm -hmm. hyper environmental view. And so there's a lot of polarization around mm -hmm. this, and that automatically creates controversy. And one of my first experiences with the controversy around this word was when I was down doing an internship in Tasmania. And I had just gotten back from taking samples, doing, we're taking core samples from lakes up in the Cradle Lake or the Cradle Mountain area. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the highest points in Tasmania. And the reason we went there is there's a lot of mountain lakes that don't ha experience that much disturbance. And so we go out on the deepest point, take a core sample, and then we're able to s look at the pollen and the charcoal and things called diatomes mm -hmm. to figure out what 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 was going on with the plant community and what mm -hmm. was going on with a fire at different parts in the past. And on our way back down back down from the mountain, there was this tourist woman that was complaining that there was some toilet paper on the side of the trail. Mm -hmm. And the guide or the the bus driver guy was debating her saying hey look we can't keep people out of these areas the whole point of this is people interact with mm -hmm. the the landscape out here and she was saying well i just wish that i would if if i'm going to pay all this money to come out here i sh should be able to experience a pristine wilderness mm -hmm. and he's saying that well that's not really what wilderness is mm -hmm. humans have always been here mm -hmm. and the point of what we're trying to teach people by having this this reserve, this park, is that 
not only is this an amazing place and there's all this wildlife and all this crazy plant life, but humans have always been here, mm -hmm. which is a little bit incorrect because humans hadn't always been there, <laughs> but it's, it really struck me that there's mm -hmm. this bus driver guy <laughs> having a debate with this tourist lady Mm -hmm. And she was complaining about the toilet paper and that she didn't want to see human presence mm -hmm. there. And it's a pretty remote place. The closest hospitals are like two hours away. And it that was the first time I really actually thought about what is wild? Mm -hmm. What is wilderness? And well, I don't know. I don't really know how I was getting how that affected me but I'm uh -huh. sure I'm going to be thinking about that for the rest of my life what was your first experience with the, the word oh I don't even know um well I think I I'm, I definitely the, had heard it before but yeah. I never really thought about it um looking more into the Mission Mountain wilderness area that we have with the tribe um I think that's always been on my mind, the idea of that wilderness and how um, a lot of the people really wanted to preserve uh, the missions, mm. and they did, and now we have this wilderness area. Um, yeah, I mean, wildlife, I've probably known more about the wildlife aspect of it and understanding that wildlife needs certain corridors they have certain migrations i mean they were here long before humans were um they've kind of kept this path and i was learning about habitat fragmentation in at haskell we were talking about a bypass road that was going to go through a wetland area the haskell baker wetlands and with that, uh, lots of migration, whether it's smaller reptilians, uh, mammals. One thing that I did was I counted along the roadway the, ooh, what is the correct name for it? Um, it's roadkill, but there is a name for it. Uh, mortality induced or... Oh, I can't remember the name, but there's a real name for roadkill. But we vehicle counted... <laughs> induced mortality. Maybe I can't remember what it is. I have no um, idea, but <laughs> I, know there's always I can't funny remember either. <laughs> but I, I, I think at that point I started to realize the uniqueness of wilderness and and what people call wilderness. Uh, these wetlands, again, longer than humans. Lawrence being there I think it's it's interesting that's probably when I first started to think about it in a little bit of a different context but I would say the last five years probably since we started the master's program is when I started to delve deeper into the world wil word wilderness and then of course getting into public lands seeing what a lot of people considered wild lands and all these wild lands are uh, an example is like Yosemite. When people first, uh, when settlers first got to Yosemite, um, they said that it had the appearance of a, a well-kept park already. Mm. But like you and I, we've read M. Cat Anderson's Tending the Wild we understand that that ecosystem long before, yes, I have it no. on my shelf too. <laughs> long before realized. Yeah. Yes. I mean, wonderful. I book. highly suggest it's a huge book, but delves into Californian indigenous people and how they've maintained that landscape. And you can tell at that point that it is not this pristine kind of, um, what do they call it? They called it a, uh a cathedral mm. it was like this ah moment and for them 
to then just completely bypass all of this indigenous tending that they've done to the landscape um, is still kind of present in a lot of ways with public lands and visitor services with public lands. Yes, it's kind of like my that's, intro. that's totally true. And I think that's a perfect point to get into defining what wild is. Mm -hmm. And from the dictionary definition, or the said that kind of weird, the dictionary definition, it's an adjective. It means feral, savage, unbroken, brute, undocile, <laughs> wilding, undomesticated, brutal barbarous, untamed, barbarous. uncontrolled, uncivilized, unsubdued. So those would be some of the synonyms. Mm -hmm. But the, the definition is living in a state of nature and not ordinarily tame or domesticated wild ducks. Yeah, I don't think that's... <laughs> I think we messed up or maybe it was the spell correct but the the point is is living in a state of nature and not ordinarily tame or domesticated another one is growing or produced without human aid or care oh that's what it is it's an example wild ducks oh I see the, the notes confused yeah. me <laughs> and another example wild honey and another definition is related to or resembling a corresponding cultivated or domesticated organism as if of or relating to wild organisms. Another one is not inhabited or cultivated like wild land or not amenable to human habitation or cultivation or desolate. And then an the last one we have here is not subject or restrained or regulated, uncontrolled, also unruly, <laughs> kind of like unruly. That, that, that dude's wild, man. <laughs> that chick's wild. <laughs> and a lot of those words have a lot of impact and a, a lot of uh, what's that called? Baggage, a mm. lot of baggage with them, especially savage. Or yes. barbarous. Which, yeah. Savage was our last word that we talked about. That's right. Yeah. Uncivilized. Uncivilized. Yeah. I can imagine a lot of people think a lot of other things when they hear those words. Mm -hmm. And I, I understand if you have lived in a city, if you're from another country, if you're not used to sprawling open landscapes especially with towering mountains it can be a little overwhelming i mean you can think that it would be or yellowstone with geysers and thermal activity you can think that these places are uninhabitable and you you can desolate and nobody would live there nobody would work the landscape but i think that's where as we start to learn more about different worldviews, as more indigenous people come into public lands, I think that narrative is something that can easily be changed to better teach how prior to these national parks and our other public lands, how they were managed and how those people interacted and help people build a deeper connection with that public land that they're visiting. I think it's hard if you're just going to see once in a lifetime, I'm only going one year, how then do you connect people to land differently? And I think you kind of have to change the narrative of what was created with the Wilderness Act. Yeah. And, and how do you do that with people that spend most of their time in cities? Yeah. I don't really have a solid answer for that. I have <laughs> plenty of ideas, which we'll get into later. But before we get into the Wilderness Act, there's the etymology or the history and the development of this word. Seems it's really fascinating to me. And it's a combination, like many English words, of different languages. It comes from Anglian or the word wald, also Saxon, which is wield and even Norse origins. And wilderness, etymologically speaking, is talking about a wilder, uninhabited, or uncultivated place with wild animals. 
and wild mm. in the natural state is something that is considered in a natural state or uncultivated, untamed, undomesticated, uncontrolled or forested wooded upland, which is really interesting because later in the history of this word, it shifted to where it talked about open spaces, kind of mm. almost referring to the deforestation of places in Europe, especially mm. England or the the British islands. Mm -hmm. And thinking that this word is just like all other words changes in its definition over time is fascinating to me and also gives me hope to where we can redefine it and start looking at a different definition where it's not un uninhabited. It's not mm -hmm. uncultivated. It's not a place with only wild animals, but also wild humans. And <laughs> That's something that I've always had a disagreement with this separation of humans from nature, as if we're mm. not natural. Anything we make is unnatural. It's inorganic mm. or what's that? Another word for that. Um, Biophilia. I love biophilia. <laughs> it's not the word <laughs> I was looking for. But so yeah, that, uh, that, that, that hits at the point. The, the point mm -hmm. I was trying to make here is that we are fundamentally a part of nature. Even this computer, this technology we're using right now to record mm -hmm. this podcast is, is natural because it's an expression of our nature, of mm -hmm. human ingenuity, of, of our, it's, a, it's almost like a phenotypic expression mm -hmm. of our genome. And that is so fascinating to me. I, I can barely contain <laughs> my, my glee that, and my hope for the future. Because mm -hmm. if we deny our own, our own nature, it's going to be really hard to reconnect with nature. Mm -hmm. And I think connecting with nature is the important part. One thing that I love about being nature is it improves my mental health, my spiritual well-being, my physical well-being. I get some exercise in. Mm. It has the potential to really help people who it's so tough when like it's just a visit and you have a short amount of time and you kind of want to cram everything into the trip especially if it's one of those uh you're yeah, only especially gonna going through yellowstone a couple of them mm -hmm. when which you're is just so trying to, big. when you're just going through yeah, yeah i mean you don't get yellowstone if you only have one day i mean i would recommend a week minimum mm. in yellowstone if you can yeah, there's so a you lot can see there. everything there's i mean there's so much again depending on time of year it's wonderful but when you have that short amount of time i always think that you are on a mission you're there to hike to a certain spot you're there to see a certain visitor center you're there to see a geyser or an arc yeah. you're, you're there to see something and or get too close to a buffalo and get your car destroyed <laughs> <laughs> get <Yes>. bored <laughs> maybe there that's your mission life yeah i wildlife do not recommend I don't, I don't recommend that mission but you will hey. lose that's a mission you're gonna lose <laughs> and i think they get so centrally focused instead of smelling the plants knowing the plants understanding how that ecosystem was created geologically Places are fascinating if you can sit there and open your blinders when you're in these public lands. Mm. I think they're wonderful, but it is up to like the individual people to how they experience that land. And I do recommend observations. Try to see how many observations you can see on a hike. What are you looking at? And that also helps you be bear aware. If you're not from the Northwest and you're not used to hiking with bears, if you're centrally focused, it's quite easy to come across one, especially anywhere in the GYE. Very easy. And oh, yeah. so it keeps you aware. You're not startled. And for people that aren't aware, what does GYE stand for? Greater Yellowstone Ecosystem. Boom. It's massive. It's, it's huge. It's a huge, huge area. One yeah. of the most unique places on the planet. It is. And it's because a lot of people wanted, understood how important this landscape was. Whether the intent was to promote 
a richer tourist destination. It did conserve and protect this GYE, which is so unique in the entire world. Yeah, I might have this wrong, but wasn't that the first national park ever created? Yep, Yellowstone was the first national park. Yeah, I could have swore I heard that somewhere. Yep. Somewhere in one of those classes I took years ago. <laughs> and, and it's wonderful yeah, that it's it's saved. Um and it's also it's one of those where like it's always so wonderful that people had the foresight to save this landscape. At the same time, there was so much broken treaties and hard navigating for indigenous people that went to Yellowstone every year for like Tim talked about with oh that episode is not coming out yet um seasonal rounds and understanding how to be in the landscape there's a lot of moving every month you're kind of collecting and saving for something and Yellowstone was a major part to at least 27 tribes and to have that all taken away, they even created a law that prohibited hunting in Yellowstone because of indigenous people. It is something that, while beautiful, there is a history that is hard for some people to be on that landscape today. And that, that's true for all national parks, as, I've, as far as I know. Is yep. Although the treaty rights give us the privilege and the right to be able to go and mm -hmm. not just that, but the responsibility to be able mm -hmm. to go there and collect plants and hunt animals. And I've been doing this since I was a kid. I don't know if that'll get me in trouble or not, but going to the bison <laughs> range, getting sage and going not in trouble. Okay. I, I mean, because the, the way I always considered it is that's our obligation. Mm-hmm not not just yeah. for to get sage but to take care of it to get mm -hmm. so that sage will come back next year stronger mm -hmm. and healthier and more widespread but also in, in the in glacier park it's a pastime of my family to go in there and hunt mm -hmm. even though the rangers didn't they didn't always like that and sometimes mm -hmm. it resulted in conflict direct conflict sometimes even violent Mm -hmm. but that's weird because the treaty rights guaranteed quote unquote guaranteed that mm -hmm. and thinking that th this idea of wild and wilderness had such an impact on why people were barred from accessing that mm -hmm. is uh it's a uh, it's troubling but also very interesting yeah. to me History, just thinking about history and how his history plays out and how it affects mm -hmm. our world today. Mm -hmm. And I think it's an important history that should be talked about in these public spaces that are public lands. I think that while it seems like so long ago, uh, the late yeah, 1800s, it's not so much. 1900, yeah. it's, it's not that long ago in, in hindsight. It's really not, especially as indigenous people who generally think seven generations ahead of them but probably even more and when you're thinking about that it's it's not that long a period you've had boarding schools you had forced removal off of their original homelands there was so much trauma that's happened and that's not just with indigenous people i think there was also slavery in african americans or black people that had a really hard time with this whole wilderness act being created there was still a lot of people who were not allowed in those public lands and still to this day have a hard time going to those spots and i think it's wonderful i think everybody should look into the closest park that you have i will tell you within an hour or an hour and a half there is probably a now national wildlife refuge by you yeah that's kind of that's a, and that's a really unique thing to this country it how is how many national parks and how many areas are reserved in that mm -hmm. way there's so many and i think just 
how we always think that you are stuck in the city. I think the Wilderness Act, which is now, I think, protects over 100 million, 110, 110 million acres of federal lands is impressive. It's it's a lot <laughs> when you think about it. It's I hard mean, to imagine how, like, if you put it, if you put it all yeah. in one spot, how big that is. Can you can you guess the na- the nation's what percentage of federal lands is protected by the Wilderness Act? What percentage of the nation's land base? The whole nation. Mm, what is a percent? Ten percent. Lower. Point one percent. No, five percent. <laughs> so you're close. I mean, if you went in the middle, that's yeah. it. Well, I, I went a little bit, <laughs> I, I went a little more extreme downward. <laughs> Drastic. So before we get too much further, can you define the Wilderness Act? Uh, Just talk about what, like, I don't think we talked about when it was established, did we? Oh yeah, we did. Right when I first brought it up. I don't. 1964. <laughs> yeah. I think I said that right away. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it it initially um, was designed for Congress to reserve um, for itself the authority to designate federal lands as part of the system. Uh, the system is huge. Uh, er, everything pretty much fall. Any public land falls underneath the system. They initially designated 54 uh, wilderness areas that contained uh, 9.1 million acres of national forest lands. Um, one of them is the one we talk about often, the one that I'm fingers crossed going to be strong enough to go hike through, the Bob yeah. Marshall. Really going to work to that. That's one of my goals. I will send photos I'm be to there everybody. This summer. See, that's my goal. I I would love to kind of spend some time this summer um and see it. But that's one of them. I mean, really close to our where we f- we're from. Uh, but again, like I said today, it's now nearly 110 million acres. And that includes though, oh man, the Forest Service, the Department of Ag, National Park Service, uh, Fish and Wildlife Service, the Bureau of Land Management, our favorite one. Um, and then the Department of Interior, which yeah. is our favorite because we love Deb. So we love the Department of Interior. And the DOI or the Department of the Interior is ex, ex- it has an extraordinary amount of power. It does. Um, given the right presidential candidate and the right hiring, I think it does. I think it proves that with having a indigenous woman at the helm right now what she has she's been gonna rename to a bunch done. of stuff now Did you hear oh about she's that? going she's going oh, yeah. ham. love it that's some. Um, i don't Go always agree it. with things at the federal level but i really like that mm-hmm. renaming things because in the locked up in those names is a lot of understanding mm-hmm. of what that place is not just what oh, yeah. it not just what it has but what it is mm-hmm. And that I I'm excited for that. I think that's a I think that's a really good move. Mm-hmm. The one that I'm always gonna vouch for that the moment I found out it had a different name, I was like, ooh, they should change it. They used to call the Teton Mountains Tiwanak, and it means many pinnacles. I think it's perfect. I think it's a perfect understanding of what the Teton mountain range looks like. Many pinnacles. They, I have never seen a mountain shoot straight up from the ground. Our, our Mish mountains have a great interface slowly increase, but this one mission mountains are like, remind me of Mordor. It does. It's like a giant wall. It's always my favorite. Mm Mm-hmm. Or a bunch, like you said, pinnacles, a bunch of spikes coming up yep. out of the earth. I think that's a beautiful name. But thanks to some fur trappers, it now means uh, many breasts. And I'm just like, why? <laughs> <laughs> why does it have to be that? <laughs> I want- Oh, 
Um, I think it's beautiful. Vouch for that name change. Well, I'm pretty sure the internet just cut out a little bit. Yeah, and I think it, it has to be mine. I'm pretty sure. I think it's because I got, like, my kids are watching TV, <laughs> and my mom's watching TV, and my cousin is probably gaming on his <laughs> doing. Oh, yeah, the, and we are recording those, pretty late, too. The What is that? A mass multiplayer game oh so well and then everybody else around you is using internet too probably yeah. everybody's at night so sorry about this like we said it's only a it's kind of an informal episode where we're just chatting if there's anything that you would like us to repeat please send us a message we will get back to you yeah you were talking about clarify. how uh the guy basically renamed it titties he and... did. <laughs> Drives me nuts. I my opinion is it needs to be changed. It needs to go back to T will not. I that is where I'm standing. I understand it's the a cool national word park. Too. It just it sounds cool. It, beautiful. It is a beautiful word. It it's it love it. And that's that's me. That's that's I'll I'll kind die of, on it that. It makes hill. me think of something from Dune. Um in which I mean perfect. Something setting. like a perfect cool setting. gnarly badass mm -hmm. place there is a mountain peak named it but i think the whole thing should be named it mm -hmm. so that's where i die that's my i will fight for it oh the, yeah the hill you <laughs> will die on the hill i die on is renaming grand teton national park <laughs> which isn't good because it's a beautiful national park i suggest everybody come mm i've never really spent much time there i've i've always driven past it mm -hmm. and been like whoa maybe stop and spend a little more time saying whoa <laughs> i know it was the sweetest thing my parents came and we were it was in september and it was my dad's birthday so i brought them to jenny lake for a really fancy dinner it's like a preset prefix meal and seeing my how happy that made my parents just off of being in nature being in this what they call the cabin in the woods seeing the landscapes i saw the mountains different that day and i have never thought of it the same i have a deeper connection again i think just the more you could return to the land i think the deeper that connection is you'll never lose that connection you're only going to gain more observations you're gonna see rare animals you're gonna see beautiful flowers blooming or the reds and yellows and oranges of fall it's it's beautiful mm. i like how much you use the word observations i am all for observations <laughs> nobody does observations anymore i have a field book yeah people that might I see draw. something yeah you might be looking but are you observing no, I even have a little field guide book that I take leave so I can identify. I think observations is how you can build that deeper connection. If you're just like on a mission of working out, your mindset is working out. Your mindset is not enjoying the nature. The purpose of it has to be observing the nature, observing the landscape, observing the systems at play and understanding water cycles and food systems and every how everything is interconnected i just love it so i think everybody should do more observations i agree i think so often people get lost in the haze mm -hmm. whatever they're doing and then they're not really paying attention they're just floating and it is it's a tragedy i feel like that's partially why i stopped taking pictures and paying a lot of attention to photography is i felt like i wasn't really observing i was just trying to find a scene mm -hmm. and not really taking it in mm -hmm. i mean i yeah. i fully understand that people love to work out in nature and take photos and be engaged that way I just think once in a while, shut everything off, hmm. go on a small hike, see what you can see in 30 minutes and then bring out your cell phone. 
but try to be present in the moment. And that's like, that's tough for me. I have a lot of anxiety and like my brain just like wanders 24 seven. And I think it's helped me a lot with calming down and breathing and being and meditating and kind of sitting in that nature. There is a lot of Facebook groups that in your town that will be doing walks and small hikes I know in Jackson here. Um, Depends on the town. I could come. Not so many here in West. Depends on the town. That's true. I mean, people do go out for sure, but not. There's not a lot of groups necessarily. I mean, even if it's one or two people. Yeah, invite your friend. That's a start. That's a start, and then maybe they'll invite another friend, and then maybe they'll invite yeah. another friend, and then you'll have this huge hiking group, and it, it will become this whole thing. But don't be afraid to start it. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm of like at. meetups. Do you know about yeah. that app, Meetups? That's a oh no, I don't great, know about that. It's an app or slash website where you can organize groups to do things. Mm-hmm. And I looked around locally, and there's doesn't seem like there's any kind of meetups for going out hiking. I it's know just, there's it's, an... a, it's tragic because there, there's uh-huh. so much out there to to explore and experience and to observe. There is so much, and I do know another one which um, somebody here told me about was it's called Hike a Baby. It's an app too, and it's oh, yeah. groups so that will for hiking. Yep, specific for hiking. It seems to be kind of a nationwide thing. Again, it unfortunately might not be in some of your places, but you could start it. You could be that initial yeah. hike a baby. Um... <laughs> Why is a baby? What's a baby have to do with it? <laughs> I have no hike idea. Baby. Make sure hike you bring a baby, and you, you well, strap I, I that think... baby in. <laughs> you got to strap it in your They are very family pack. friendly. The ones I have been on, there have been kids. Mm-hmm. And so it is it is more family friendly, which is good if you're starting off hiking. If you are scared about being out of shape, there is one hiker that I refuse to go with until I could be more active and I could keep up because I don't want to be embarrassed. If you are feeling embarrassed, it would be a great starting point. Take your time. You're kind of enjoying the views with some kids. They're kind of running around. You're not really it's not a serious hike. Oh, yeah. And uh a lot of my friends and myself included, if we're going hiking, we're going hiking. Yeah. Means well, not me. I'm we're enjoying getting it. somewhere and <laughs> we're, our legs are probably going to be on fire and you might experience some pain. No, you're not Mike. You definitely will experience some pain. And uh, I love that though. That's the kind that I like to do. I don't want to just go for a stroll. I want to hike mm-hmm. and going for a walk in the woods is different than a hike in my opinion. Yeah. That's just always um, how I've been since I was a kid though. Yeah. And that's a good thing to like point out is you can be a serious hiker. There are some people who are like, hiking is my gym. My world is hiking. I can hike 12 miles a day or longer. I'll do like a week long. And there's some people who are, I like to hike because I want to see nature and I want I mean, to take miles my time. Nothing, man. For oh, real oh, hikers, like we're talking, dying. we're talking twenty plus, twenty four miles. Oh yeah, yeah, easily, up and down mountains, do and it's crazy. Mm-hmm. But and I mean, like you, you're you, you feel like your hips are gonna come out of socket, mm-hmm. your shoulders are just killing you. You feel like you you want to give up, but that's the beauty of it is you don't. Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's always a there's always a threshold. You got to know your limits so you don't hurt yourself and get into mm-hmm. a survival situation. But man, there's a lot of power in that move, pushing beyond your comfort zone. Mm-hmm. That's what I've always liked about hiking. And even just being out in the mountain yeah, is getting out of your comfort zone and experiencing something that you will, you will never, ever get mm-hmm. if you don't leave your house or if you don't leave town, if you don't get off the trail every now and then. Mm-hmm. But well, again, you got to, you got to, you got to be careful. Mm-hmm. because if you don't have the experience, you don't have the skills to do that, you might get yourself killed. And yes. even worse, you might get someone else killed. Mm-hmm. So yeah. Or, ex- or expelled. Always pay it, you know, observe. It's a great word. It, yeah. Oh man. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It be smart with public lands and what you do yeah i'm not Uh, i'm not not necessarily talking about public lands all the time but yeah 
Yeah, There's hiking is a, it's a yeah. great pastime. I I think my mm-hmm. first hike, I was nine, like a actual backpacking trip mm-hmm. where I was carrying a lot of weight for six hours straight up a mountain. And I hated it. But once you get there, you start relaxing, mm-hmm. you set up your camp, you start cooking your food, you go fishing. Oh, wow. There's uh, there's not many experiences that I can say have brought me more calmness and confidence mm-hmm. than doing oh, something yeah. like that. But yeah, it's dangerous. It's fundamentally dangerous. So don't take it lightly. Don't act like you can just go out there mm-hmm. because you can't. <laughs> you might get yourself killed or s- someone else killed. And that happens every year almost here in Montana. I'm mm-hmm. sure you, is that, is that something you hear about there in Wyoming a lot is hikers or mountaineers getting lost. Yeah. A couple of people fall, fall off. That's that's usually the, it's the mechanical injuries yeah. that usually get people. Some grizzly attacks. I think, yeah, just, just being smart. And um, I mean, Montana, that's kind of where another idea came was uh, Rosalind, Lapeer, who is at the University of Montana, uh, did an article. I think it might have been a, a, oh, what are they, opinion piece about how Missoula should say goodbye to the words wild and wilderness. And I think I sent this to you when it first came out a long time ago. And one of the claims is that Montana is untamed, wild, and natural. Hmm wild montanans wild Wild montana it's just like yellowstone yellowstone these articles i that show drives me nuts i'm not a fan oh the (laughs) yellowstone show i i know people love it people love the show kevin costner's in that right i have honestly is that kevin costner or is that is that another i don't know i think it might be i think it is i think you're right and uh, yeah, he definitely he's a good good at playing a roughneck. Mm-hmm. I've I think I've seen clips of the show. Mm-hmm. I've seen I've the seen main show. I him. remember him from is Dances with mm-hmm. Wolves, which is the classic show that people either love or hate. And mm-hmm. this is the thing: my great grandma loved that show, <laughs> and she's she was Dakota, and she oh yeah, people love love she it. She actually came over and from the east in the 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 planes she came over on covered wagon and she mm-hmm. she told stories about how the water would come through the floorboards when they crossed the missouri river Jeez. and um and she loved that show and so it's mm-hmm. hard for me to hate on it i know and, but i can i can yeah. see the troubles people have with it with the whole white savior stuff how kevin costner came in and tried to save the tribe but in, in my perspective it's not even about that it's about the, the people and how they accepted him in, how mm-hmm. they welcomed him in with trepidation in the beginning, of course. Mm-hmm. But once he proved himself, he earned his spot. They welcomed him. Mm-hmm. They didn't, it wasn't about his skin color, it was about what he did. And I really appreciate that because that's the way I was raised. Being mm-hmm. native is not about the color of your skin, it's about how you act and how you treat people, how you engage with the world around you mm-hmm. how you see yourself in this universe where you situate yourself mm-hmm. and um yeah so yeah. anyways uh <laughs> yellowstone i haven't seen it i think i've seen clips I, th- I saw a clip where he and his buddy his rancher buddies had a mm-hmm. bunch of i think they had ar-15s <laughs> and they came out and these bikers were gonna burn his field or something uh-huh. And he said, no, nah, not here, man. Not here. Or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> I've seen clips, but I've seen clips of the daughter. I, guess, I think it's his daughter. Her name is Beth. I know the name, um, but she seems nuts. I'm just like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> it's like she's always beat up some days. And I'm like, what's happening? It's, I never see clips. I, I never see the full thing. But I do know that they film by the medicine tree because when we, my mm. family went to go to the medicine tree one year um my mom made us pull over so she could take a photo of the ranch <laughs> ah. I was like, ah. 
don't know how I feel about that, but if so, it's in the Bitterroot Valley, which again Dang. was the indigenous people who people are fawning over in this Yellowstone movie don't understand that where they're filming, people were indigenous people were forcibly removed from that land. It's it's just this big circle. Everything's a circle. Yeah. And that's the thing is um there's so many times where they were forced out. Mm -hmm. And then there's other times where there was treaty signed and they left. Yeah. But then some people didn't want to go. Mm -hmm. And so they stayed. And then plenty of times that happened, atrocities followed. So that the the whole world word wilderness and wild, especially when it comes down to words like savage and barbarous, uncivilized. There's a lot of baggage, again, that comes with those words that's mm -hmm. very often asso associated with indigenous people. That doesn't mean anything beyond someone's perception of it, mm -hmm. because the history of it is often very different. And something I would like, I want to talk about here is Aldo Leopold and some of the things he taught, said about wilderness. And he's one of the first ecologists. And he talked about wilderness as being the raw material out of which man has hammered the artifact called civilization. And that is a, such a profound thing to say. Uh, I'm going to say it again. Wilderness is the raw material out of which man has hammered the artifact called civilization. And that goes back to this dichotomy that we often talk about between urban and country people living out of the context of a city landscape mm -hmm. realizing that you can't escape nature you can't escape reality in a city you kind of can but in a, in, in a way you can't because even mm -hmm. in a big city there's still plenty of animals there's a, an entire ecosystem living and it creates itself Mm -hmm. No matter where we go, what we do, there's always that present that I mean, we say nature, we say wild, but and it's not separate from humans. We are in nature. We are mm -hmm. wild. We're a part of all of it. And even when we disconnect ourselves socially or culturally, it doesn't really change it. Even in cities, there mm -hmm. are ecosystems surrounding us mm -hmm. constantly. I mean, there are yeah. birds, plants, trees, bugs, pollinators, flowers, rain, sun, wind. Let's just say them all. Oh yeah, you gotta you gotta list those abiotic <laughs> abi abiotic factors. Rocks. Let's we'll go deeper. We'll say the Ooh. entire ecosystem. <laughs> Rocks, water, light, cosmic. Radiation, yeah. <laughs> gravity, yeah. all of it, the stars, yeah. the Milky Way. Oh man, that's such a fascinating th thing to think about is how gravity affects ecology on different mm -hmm. planets mm -hmm. where like here with pollination, where the, we can have spores float in the wind or seeds go in the water, seeds carried through the indest, uh, uh, ingested and pooped out somewhere else by um, ungulates or bears. And there's so many things going on, but thinking on a planet where there's less gravity or more mm -hmm. gravity, how would that work? Would they maybe have clumps of spores that would go through or maybe mm -hmm. spores that were are surrounded by some kind of a film or a bubble that mm -hmm. give it more buoyancy in the atmosphere? Mm-hmm. <laughs> that's that's pretty crazy Boy. and man um that's something i love to think about is ecology on other planets mm -hmm. uh and it's it's nuts because relegating ourselves to a position outside of wild or natural is one of the greatest mistakes humans have ever ever made mm. linguistically mm -hmm. in my opinion and I think Aldo 
Leopold understood that and why he decided to write this book, A Sand County Almanac, which is kind of a tongue twister. I got to say it slow. It is. And I really like this book for a lot of reasons, particularly because of some of the things he has to say about wilderness and wild and what that actually means. And there's this one section here where he talks about yeah here and bear with me bear with me it's a little bit of a it's not too long but what he says is ability to see the cultural value of wilderness boils down in the last analysis to a question of intellectual humility the shallow-minded modern who has lost his rootage in the land assumes that he has already discovered what is important. It is such who prate of empires, political or economic, that will last a thousand years. It is only the scholar who appreciates that all history consists of successive excursions from a single starting point, to which man returns again, and again, to organize yet another search for a durable scale of values. It is only the scholar who understands why the raw wilderness gives definition and meaning to the human enterprise. It's a powerful statement. And I know some people don't like Aldo, but I'm an ecologist and I, I love the history and development and the philosophy of science. And I think he's one of the greats mm -hmm. when it comes to that. And he definitely didn't get everything right. And nobody does. No, but that statement, that paragraph that I just read says so much about his perception and view mm -hmm. of wild places that it's all bullshit. The reality yeah. is, is we are, just as mo much a part of that as the loon mm -hmm. on the lake. We are just as much a part of that as that camas flower in the field. Mm -hmm. We're just as much a part of it as the worm in the soil. Mm -hmm. And we need to understand that if we want not just to be good stewards, but better people. Mm -hmm. And didn't his perspectives change later through his talks with indigenous people and totally. his changing perspectives that he was starting to learn? So a lot of his early writings are not the same as his later ones. And I, I do like the that's Sands healthy. County. Mm -hmm. It's a healthy. I mean, that should happen with all of us. If you mm -hmm. can't change your opinion based off of new information uh not, not sure what to tell you you're no. probably gonna get lost and confused <laughs> and bitter at some point mm -hmm. it's not a good way to live your life you got to be able to change your mind mm -hmm. if you and, and be willing to be wrong mm -hmm. be okay with it oh yeah being wrong and i think that's what it's it, it's important now that we're talking about these ideas of uh, wild and, and wilderness and kind of pushing back on the original narrative that people have talked about yeah. i think now is the right time to talk about it more people are understanding i think people's perspectives are changing covid helped a lot with people understanding how important public lands are outdoors kind of being in nature itself and There is a lot of baggage that comes with that, though. Um, but it's healthy to kind of have these conversations while also understanding the original narratives that were created and the original ideas to why these lands were created. Mm -hmm. Yes, one way to guarantee a conversation without a conclusion is to ask a group of people what nature is. Yes. I saw that quote and I was like, you know what? That's a tough question. I could imagine that going in infinite, in infinite amount of ways, depending on where you come from, how you're raised, what is your education? What do you do? What are your hobbies? It can change a lot of things. I think nature in wildlands 
are very much different person to person. And another person I'd recommend is this guy. If Americans want to learn about the, some of the original ideas about nature when it concerns Mm -hmm. American culture, Mm -hmm. Ralph Waldo Waldo Emerson has an entire essay on it. And a lot of it is very Abrahamic Mm. for lack of a better term, where he relates a lot to God and things like that, Mm -hmm. but I can relate with it. And this idea of caretaking Mm-hmm. is is a, a theme I've come up across here. Uh, it's not about separation. It's about connection. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, that is something that's probably misinterpreted a lot, especially some of these early philosophers from American mm-hmm. history. For example, one thing he says here is, or it's the wrong one here. I got all these pages marked. And again, it's, I don't know why more people don't read the classics. <laughs> like, the classics San Calme Almanac, classics. like Emerson. And mm-hmm. I was, I was reading Thoreau earlier today. Books like this. Uh, Thoreau had a huge part with national parks. Yeah. And even if you disagree with it, mm-hmm. you should still read it so you can have an informed opinion. So you can actually understand where the other side is coming from, where what so you can understand what you disagree with. Mm-hmm. There is a, a good book called uh, Dispossessing the Wilderness, Indian Removal and the Making of the National Parks. It's from 1999. And it's by uh, Mark David Spence. So a lot of older books, but I do think it is important because if you do not understand the narratives and the theories of these original founders of national parks, uh, you really can't understand how to change the narrative for the future. Mm -hmm. And that reminds me of one of the sayings in the, the art of war from Sun Tzu is if you understand yourself, you understand your enemy, Mm -hmm. you need not fear the results of a hundred battles. Mm-hmm. And that is so true for, for almost anything you're going to do that that's mm-hmm. important in your life. You can't just understand what you like and what you agree with. You have to understand the other side too. Mm-hmm. Otherwise you're, a, you're probably going to lose at some point. I mean, you will. And I have a, uh, another, another quiz for you real quick. Oh yeah. Good old so, pop quiz. I'm pop quiz, pop quiz. So how do, what is, the how how do you say this the saying that's most associated with the national park system what is that motto or kind of quote a how, saying how, like a sure. saying pack it in pack it out <laughs> true but no not that not quite that one it's like um when people think about the national Is that park number system, two yes, they think about this. Maybe that wasn't a good one. Maybe I'm not. Maybe I'm not phrasing it well. When people think of the founding of national parks, what do they think it as? Hopefully, hmm. that was a better way. So when they think of the founding of the national parks, the f- yep, how they started, how they started, there to is cons- a saying to conserve nature. I wish it was that, but no. <laughs> it shows my bias. <laughs> it is America's greatest idea. Hmm. Interesting. Which I don't. I don't agree with that. <laughs> I'd say maybe, maybe top five, maybe. (laughs) I can think of plenty of the ones that top (laughs) that one. Like, yeah. That's generally what people, that's generally what people say. I don't know why they say it. America's greatest idea. huh? Yes. It's the national park system. 
which if you do not read the books Ledger suggested or the one that I did that kind of breaks down wilderness in national parks, uh, you really won't understand why this idea that it was America's greatest idea. Who says that though? Is it like the, the general best. population or is it yeah, scholars? I mean, people just scholars, everybody. I've heard that multiple well, times. Scholars are not everyone. That's a pretty privileged class. Anybody? I've heard people talking about it. Just it's America's greatest idea. It is a pretty when good it idea. Happened. It is a pretty good idea. I would agree. Don't know if it's the greatest. Don't know what the greatest idea is. Um, hmm. yeah, but that's I, a, that, oh, yeah. dang. That's a, now there's a question. What's the greatest idea? <laughs> what is the greatest? Oh, wow. That's a lot of pressure. That is, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I don't know that one. Um, but I, I, but I think when you delve deeper into what we've chatted about a little bit, and we haven't gone into a lot of resources, it's been our opinion, and so we haven't really shared a lot. But I think this idea of it being America's greatest idea, uh, while kicking out and displacing many indigenous people in the process, and also there are many national parks that had colored only sections where people of color were not allowed to be in i just think that the idea for national parks in the beginning was for white tourists to go to a place that they deemed pristine and that is something that is sometimes still portrayed in visitor centers i think there's a big push to kind of change the narratives in that but I do think it highlights like kind of um, kill the Indian, save the man. I think there was these things that really pushed towards it. And I think national parks were another way um, to kill native people. And it shows you how resilient indigenous people are because still there, just like you said, still going and collecting plants. I think it's once you build that deep connection to land, it's very hard to get rid of that connection. Yeah, but, well, some of the, yeah. these early folks, especially in the early 20th century, they were eugenicists. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you ever read heard about those letters between Muir and Wilson? I better not talk about that because they're big here. <laughs> they're like uh, everywhere. Okay. I mean, but yes, I mean, and that's another thing. I think we highlight all these people who, like we talked about earlier with changing names, who secretly or not so secretly had very interesting personal thoughts. Yeah. And, you know, I may actually be getting that wrong. I get I get those two, some of the, the founder of the Forest Service mixed up oh, with John Mears is correct and that was the fad in the early 20th century was eugenics Mm -hmm. and it's pretty fascinating Thoreau like you mentioned I mean he had a lot of his writings are about indigenous people Yeah, they uh so and this is something that I look, I don't agree a lot with modern perceptions around critical theory, but I do like the idea of reading past literature and thinking about the context in which it was written. Mm-hmm. I think that's a great analytical tool. Mm-hmm. And thinking about how these people wrote in the past and what they wrote about and thinking about the world they lived in mm-hmm. and who they're, what kind of relationships they had with other people, what kind of ideas they were operating from, mm-hmm. what kind of worldviews they were using as a baseline context mm-hmm. is not only fascinating, but I think it's really important mm-hmm. as an analytical tool, but not as the mm-hmm. only tool. So to just completely throw it out the window doesn't make sense to me Mm -hmm. because we can still take those ideas and reinterpret them and use them Mm -hmm. for something good. Mm -hmm. Just like the wilderness idea 
and this development of the national park system. Mm -hmm. It may have these roots in these shitty ideas. That doesn't mm -hmm. mean we need to throw it out the window. No. Because it does serve a lot of good, especially when we can bring people into these places where there hasn't been development. Mm -hmm. But reinterpreting, reinterpreting them in a modern context where we realize we can't be separate. Mm -hmm. Separate. We can't be separate from these systems because they were never separate from humans to begin with. Mm -hmm. And they've been so intertwined with human activity for such a long time that to call it natural is silly. Mm -hmm. It's silly and naive. And we definitely need to move away from this notion that humans can't interact with something for it to be pristine or wild. Mm -hmm. And it, I think it's naive, but also damaging to human consciousness. Mm -hmm. Like you were saying earlier, it has such a huge benefit to our to our psyche, to mm -hmm. our emotional well being, to be able to interact with and engage with these ecosystems in a way where we're not just going and visiting, mm -hmm. but we're at, we're engaging with it. We're a part of it. We're changing it. Mm -hmm. And that's it, not even a, like the toilet yeah. paper on the side of the trail. I mean, I have picked up poop underwear. Okay. I have picked up <laughs> nasty things oh, yeah. before. We're like, you just that's, overlook that's it. That's not just cool. But at the same day. time, it's <laughs> it's an opportunity, f hopefully, for those people to realize they shouldn't be douchebags and they should probably <laughs> go shit off the trail <laughs> and bury it. Yes. And I think that's important. The more you're in there, um, it's just... You can't let little things like that um, stop you because it, it's not an, un I mean, we're, what we're saying is, is preached in many countries. It, it's not something that is unique to America. There are other countries in Europe, Asia, South America, Australia that promote being outdoors for your health. Yes. And, Zen gardens. Yeah. That's Zen not an gardens, American thing. Um, sunbathing, uh, time off to be in nature. I think probably America is probably on the lower end, honestly, about encouraging people to go out in nature. And I think that's because it was founded on this idea of rich people tourist destination. And getting past that and understanding that it is an is promoted for all people to be in that park, to be in that public land, to be on the river, to be in and, those you know, spaces. That's not, it, it does seem that that was the actual intention for it to be it, public, for to be everyone, but then special interests get involved. These yeah. giant companies get involved. These groups that have a, a vested interest in keeping certain groups of people mm -hmm. out, get involved. But the original intent, especially from the philosophers that were driving for this, it wasn't to bar anyone access. And by the time these national parks got going, natives were, the Indian wars were over and natives were on reservations. And so at that point, well, it, it, they were yellow... almost being displaced, but at the same time, their treaty rights weren't not being, they were not being honored because those areas were a part of those treaty rights, even if they're on reservations, like the Glacier National Park. That border yeah. was changed when the park was created in conflict with the treaty rights even though the people were already on a reservation. So it's, it's weird because it's, it's, it's complicated. It's not like it was, it's a one size fit all approach to how the parks were created. These wild wilderness areas, quote unquote, wild wilderness, wild. They, it does seem to become from a, a place of good intention. And then the nasty human stuff gets involved these special interest groups yeah. get involved and people take over a narrative 
and they start excluding people, especially with things like Jim Crow, mm -hmm. where they impose these e extra things that didn't even exist in the beginning, mm -hmm. which is absolutely, I think that's evil to, to lump people into groups and to say, nope, you're not allowed because you're a part of that group. Mm -hmm. Because why? That it, yeah, that there, that's wrong in so many ways that we could probably spend a whole podcast talking about how that's terrible. And Which I mean, we probably so will that's eventually. the point I'm making there is that it's it's a just like a, a lot of history, especially American history. It's messy. It's and very it's messy. Short time frame. I mean, Yellowstone was 1872. So, uh, what was it, Charlotte? was still holding strong in the Bitterroot Valley when Yellowstone was created. Like I. And that's only a couple of greats yeah. away as yeah, far as grandparents it, go. And I'm just like it, everything that all of this happened, the westward expansion, it all happened so rapidly that it's like whiplash. It's like what happened? We're here now. It's 2023. And so like over 150 years, I mean, Yellowstone just celebrated 150 years. So it's not that long. And for all of this to happen and narratives, whether you're on the side of it being preserved for wilderness, for the unique features, in particular Yellowstone and the geysers, or if you believe that it was created for a tourist attraction. Either way, the narrative now has to change. And I think so. I don't mean to interrupt you, or did I? I don't know, I don't know if I interrupt you during, mm -hmm. in, or not, but I think the the definition in the Wilderness Act itself really exemplifies what you're talking about here. That it was developed and formed from a a very basic fallacy. Mm -hmm. a very deep misunderstanding of what they're dealing with. And it says an area of wilderness is an underdeveloped federal land retaining its primeval character and influence without permanent improvements or human habitation, which is protected and managed so as to preserve its natural conditions and which generally appears to have been affected primarily by the forces of nature with the imprint of man's work substantially unnoticeable, hmm. which is a complete yep. fallacy. It is. It, it, it is scientifically incorrect. I mean, it very much is. And, and now we have different issues with public lands i mean we could have a, a whole issue how long have we been going first i don't want to delve into this if we are not too far. long just a little over an hour um now there are new issues popping up with it being completely different it's it's now i feel like it is a place for everybody where national parks are for the people it, it is for the conservation of, of for people to be in nature but now you have, oh, um, racism throwing showing through public lands in ways that make it uncomfortable for people of color to be in these public lands. Whether that's people getting called, police getting called on people of color, if it's park rangers asking for paper documents for hispanic people and latinx communities there is a lot of stress that today comes with people of color in national parks and public lands and i wanted to mention that before anything else happens i've encouraged a lot of it but i i do recognize that there are still issues to this day when it comes to people of color and presence in these spaces. It's tough. I, I've had some weird instances where people look at you funny, where I wanted to, I asked if I can use my tribal ID at the 
ticket booth. You always get a little weird looks at that. I don't think that it should stop you, but it. I do understand that that's an issue that does happen still. And it's really sad to hear. Every time I hear a negative story that a person of color has had in public lands, it is heartbreaking because I want to have everybody on that landscape and to enjoy yeah. nature, to have and those connections. Me too. I think it's fundamental to being a human, being able mm -hmm. to, to not just visit, but be a part of these places. Mm -hmm. And when you're talking about the problems that people encounter when they try to come to these places, mm -hmm. it, it got me thinking of something that I hold very dear to my heart. This idea that no one, not me, not my kids, not my mom, my dad, my grandparents, my elders, none of us can control what we get in life. Mm -hmm. None of us. But we can control how we what we do with it, mm -hmm. how we deal with it, whether we let it oppress us or not, whether we let it hurt us or not, is truly our choice. Because, yeah, we can see it for what it is. Yeah, that's that sucks. That's wrong. But to let that ruin your day. And this is, and I kind of, in my own way, my this is the way I tell myself personally is, no matter what happens, it's, it's no reason to have a bad day. Mm hmm yeah i don't i don't know if it's so much about a, oppression itself i think that there are instances that happen in these communities that still portray this narrative of it being only available to a certain type of person and that's exactly what i'm talking about is yeah. you can choose to think of it differently and say no that's not true mm -hmm. i'm gonna make it for us i'm gonna go there for us Mm -hmm. I'm going to bring my children there for us and we're going to make it something better. We're going to make it something different. doesn't mm -hmm. matter what they say. doesn't matter what the perception is because perception is mostly up here. It's mostly in your mind mm -hmm. and you can choose to roll with whatever external perception is there, or you can mold it and change it mm -hmm. and choose to make it something better. And, and just know that those workers and those employees in that public land space want you there. They want everybody there. They want everybody to experience what they are so lucky to experience as workers and who have this bond with this land. And, and everybody should be there. It just felt we, we are not talking about it because I've, I've recently heard a, lo a lot of really negative experiences with people in land in public lands is that like the bird birder lady you were talking about yeah I, that happened a, a few years ago but it always reminds it always brings me back to the 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 black man in central park who was bird watching and as i'm now starting my journey into bird watching and and having binoculars and, and being in these spaces where you're like oh. again observing you're observing nature i don't know why i thought watching. it was a lady because I remember well, you talking about this. Just so, yeah. so this lady who was walking her dog came across this black man bird watching and called oh, the cop okay. and called the cops on him, saying that she, she he was threatening her. He was aggressive when he videoed it. it. It was videoed. You can see who the aggressor was in in the video. But you hear stories like this, and you think as a person of color, uh, if he, that's happening to him when he is just bird watching what will happen to me. And I think you see these stories and it is sad because you have every right to be in that public land as well. You have every right to become a birder. You have every right to see bison, to see balsam root, to see lupin, to see Jenny Lake, to see Yosemite, to the Smokies. You have every right to be in these spaces. And just like Lija mentioned, try not to let what you're seeing 
or a previous previous experience keep you from building this connection to this landscape and to mm-hmm. nature? Yeah, because it's also a responsibility. And that's it the is. more that's the more important part about it is yes, there's rights, but all of our rights have responsibilities with them. Mm-hmm. And those responsibilities are the more important part because that's what guarantees the rights. That's what keeps the rights alive. Mm-hmm. And that's what gives them meaning. The more responsibility we take and the more we practice and actually, I don't, I don't want to say take them seriously, but the more we actually live them out in our lives, mm-hmm. the more meaning we have, the more clearly we can see the world and ourselves especially. And our responsibilities, not just to the world, but to ourselves and to be the person that we want to be. That is so important to Mm -hmm. being able to have at least a semi-positive experience when you do go to these quote unquote wild places. And Mm -hmm. uh, that's what it is. It's a responsibility, not just a right. Mm -hmm. And man it's hard to over it's hard to overstate how important that is mm-hmm. the responsibility side of things yeah and if you're still feeling uncomfortable as a person of color i do recommend i just recently listened to him give a talk so this is my recommendation not ledges cuz i was there for this presentation um is a book called the black and brown faces in america's wild places african americans making nature and the environment a part of their everyday lives and it's by dudley edmondson um this book um he has 20 african americans that share their story and their personal experiences with public lands and i think it really makes you look at how can the future be better for public lands? He's encouraging more black people, encouraging more African-Americans. There are a lot of outdoor hiking groups. Um, Latina Outdoors is a great one. Black Girls Hike too. It's only because I have listened to them talk as well uh, that are encouraging people. And so you do have a community that has understanded issues with public lands and is now changing that narrative and returning to those public spaces. I do recommend that book. Hmm. The what book is that? Uh, the B- black and brown oh, okay. faces. So you watched a presentation about the book. I did. I I yeah. by Dudley, by the author of the book. Yeah, and that sounds like something that I should check out and watchable wildlife what is that oh that's just the publication that's who publishes his book i like that (laughs) i like that phrase watchable wildlife (laughs) reminds me of like uh, something uh that's narrated by our favorite person well we disagree David Attenborough. I think you like Morgan Freeman. Yes, I think Morgan Freeman is by far the bigger badass. Oh, I don't know about that. David Attenborough, man. Something about But I don't really know about David Attenborough's upbringing. I know I I just Morgan Freeman came from poverty. He Mm -hmm. joined the yeah, he was poor as fuck when he was a kid. Oop, trying to say that F bomb less. He was really poor when he was a kid. And he went joined the military. And he made something with his life uh, through mm-hmm. hard work, mm-hmm. and uh, and he's but also he's got that that voice. He's got a good voice. He's got that a good voice, voice that I could bear. <laughs> Maybe if I practice for a couple months, I'd be I might be able to get close, but I doubt it. Uh, I I also want I just wanted to say one more thing from another classic. Changing the wild is there's this she in chapter twelve. It's the third paragraph in the 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 book. She says, restoring landscapes and ecosystems to a quote unquote natural condition may be impossible if that natural condition never existed, Mm. at least not in the last 10,000 to 12,000 years. Restorationists must 
at the very least acknowledge the indigenous influence in shaping the California landscape. Mm -hmm. This chapter advocates an additional step using indigenous people's knowledge and methods to carry out the restoration process to return landscapes to historical conditions and restore mm. the place of humans in their continuing management. Yes. And get back to that wonderful, pristine landscape that all of these founders talked about. Mm. <laughs> Even though it wasn't pristine. <laughs> and another one I I really like it's in it's in Emerson's essay on nature and specifically his section on language. He says language is a third use which nature observes to man. Nature is the vehicle of thought and in a simple double and threefold degree. One, words are signs of natural facts. And we've been talking a lot about words here. Yes, words. Two. Lots of words. Particular natural facts are symbols of particular spiritual facts. Hmm. Boom. Three. Nature is the symbol of spirit. I agree with that. If if anything has taught me anything, the most spiritual I've ever felt is in nature. Yeah, especially when you're suffering out there or not necessarily suffering, but out there experiencing pain and then giving that option of choosing to suffer for it or not. And I don't know that mm -hmm. I've learned that anywhere else except for from the mountain or when I've been in a lodge, during, mm -hmm. like doing a fast. You, There's pain yeah. in life. There's no escaping that. It's a fact of life, pain. But you, yeah. we choose to suffer for it. It's that's that part is a choice. I was going through a, a really tough breakup, and I went on a hike. And when I went through this hike, I there was a ton of wildflowers blooming. It was such a beautiful moment that again, like I was crying. I probably could cry about it now if we're being honest. Um, that really it makes you look deeper at yourself when you are by yourself in nature and you come across this breathtaking view you're not thinking about how heartbroken you are you're not thinking about the pain that you caused the person or the person caused you it's it's undescribable if you haven't had that experience i do suggest you do it there is something very unique about being in nature when you're sad <laughs> whether or not that's a good thing or a bad thing i think um allowing yourself to experience beautiful places when you're sad is undescribable in your healing and I highly recommend it. It's definitely a good thing. It is, especially when balsam root, lupin, when it's all blooming, it's you got desert leaf parsley. I mean, it's just you learn the again, observations. You <laughs> acknowledge these spaces and you yeah, connect words. with the beauty. You connect with that? it. <laughs> you said words are spiritual or something like that. It is words. <laughs> and, you know, I get a lot of people might have problems with Emerson and some of the traditions, American traditions, American philosophers. But the reality is, is American culture is not just Western. No, we played a part in this. We are just as much a part of developing this country and this culture as the Anglos as the mm -hmm. and it, it breaks my heart a little bit that it's like giving credit away and and downplaying the influence of our ancestors mm. and the and how much they affect the settlers that came here mm -hmm. how much they changed the way they saw the world 
And that's why I see in, in some of these writings, it's like, wow, this is some stuff that my elders tell me in the lodge. Mm -hmm. And it, it blows my mind that people just would, wouldn't either refuse to read these books or act like it's, it's all just bad when that's never the truth. Mm -hmm. The truth is messy. The truth is complicated. And just like each one of us, right? We're all messy. We're all complicated. Oh, so messy. <laughs> if you haven't noticed, very messy. And we're a messy bunch. Yeah, this is a this is an unexpected episode. I didn't think it was going to go the directions that it went, but it was a good one. And yes. and just to one of the final, one of the final, just to finish things off, I'd like to read this poem. It's called Ode to Beauty. Or never mind. It's too long. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I would like to it's, end. It's a long ass poem. <laughs> I, I do want to end on. I sent out. I'll just do I, that. Ode to Beauty. Yeah. Ode to Beauty. I. Ledger is wonderful and does all of our editing. I'm in charge of the social media. So generally, not always. I will be posting the social media posts. And I did one last week. Oh, no, this week some week asking for your opinions as viewers on what you your thoughts about wild and wilderness were and before we end the episode huge shout out to Alyssa has been a follower I hope you have some great road trips and I hope our podcast is still on your list as a road trip podcast but she made a comment about how there are a it is so Wild and wilderness is a European construct that separates humans from the rest of the world. While they can be useful to delineate between human-centered and other areas, it is also used to remove native peoples from our lands, which we definitely had touched about in this episode. And just a huge shout out to Alyssa for participating. It's always wonderful to hear. And she gave us another idea for a new episode. So if you ever have something that is sparking your interest that you want us to talk about, reach out. We'll love it. We'll probably do an episode. Even if we've done something similar, we'll probably do it anyways. Yeah. And I like that last sentence specifically as it concerns removing native peoples from our lands and be, be being very specific about it is the, the, what what's that called being two-faced where you make an agreement and you don't follow through on it <laughs> yes the original mean girls <laughs> yeah i mean these these treaties where we're we're supposed to be able to go there and practice our ancestral responsibilities and then we can't all of a sudden because it's a national park mm -hmm. yeah it i is. think that's a, the most specific way we can actually f talk about that Mm -hmm. and because it is, there's and there's fun. it's 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 a really wide statement it is and, and we should always be specific yeah and like we we didn't even touch about the philosophy really i mean we could have delved oh we could have i mean we could have went a lot deeper this was just kind yeah. of more of a easy fun episode that we just wanted to have a a conversation with our our listeners about how our opinion on wild and wilderness lots of and, opinion shared yeah. today yeah and I, that's that's good because i think now that i'm not so sure that so many people are willing to share their opinions especially if they may be controversial or if they may be in disagreement with another person mm -hmm. And that's why I appreciate being able to talk to, with you, Annie, because we don't always agree, mm -mm. but we can still talk about it. And we can jam out to Miley Cyrus before we film. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's right. Miley Cyrus. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> meanwhile, so you're jamming some Miley Cyrus and I'm jamming some, I don't even know what to call it yet, some rock and roll-ish so type music. And uh, and then we can There's stuff in the works. Talk about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So 
not our traditional episode, not as research based. We will have, I'm sure, some uh, literature posted in our show notes. Yeah. And as always, probably more than we even talked about knowing us, we'll probably post a couple extra just to be safe. Yes, we will. We'll we'll put as much as we can in the show notes because I think it's important for people to know where we get our ideas from and where we're basing our conversations in. But at the same time, these episodes, specifically the controversial words ones, they're going to be loose. They're going to be open. And we might even do some weird, funky things in the future. We'll see. Yes. Yes. Lots of potential. So stay listening. We'll be back in two weeks with yeah. a fun episode. I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited for our, our our future episodes. So stay tuned. Yeah, me too. And be sure to give us a like. Find us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. And always be sure to go on Apple Podcasts and give us a review because that helps so much. It's really yes. hard to overstate how much that helps with getting our mm-hmm. podcast out to new listeners, to people that may not have listened in the past or may never listen. But if you give us a review, you give us a like, they might mm-hmm. find us. So be sure to do that. It's mm-hmm. always a pleasure, Annie. Another day yes. on the End in Science show. We're going to have to make, we're going to have, one of these days, we're going to have to make it into a, like a, one of those called a, Game show. We're going to do a game show episode. Dun, 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 dun. Yes, I have Welcome stuff. Welcome to the we End have, in Science show. We have stuff in mind, but I do need more public participation if we do it. So please, please, please engage in our posts, engage in our future stuff because our listeners make our podcast better. And so please engage with us. Do not be embarrassed. We are very easygoing. As I'm trying to be better with social media, I will try to respond as soon as I can. Yeah, and I check it sometimes too, and and uh, so no matter what, we'll get back to you, and we'll get back to you yep. in a relatively timely manner. Might not be in a yep. day, but most of the time it'll be within a day, mm-hmm. and that's the best way to get a hold of us now is Instagram, Facebook, yep. maybe Twitter, maybe Twitter, better Instagram. Yeah, but yep, any of those three, please feel free, shout us our way. I'm going to end the episode <laughs> how we how we used to end it in Salish. So I'm going to go back to that. So Nemeth reached him in. Una. <laughs>